All right, I think we're live, although my picture doesn't match up what's actually happening. I think we're a few seconds delayed. Um, there it goes. All right, so we're going to look today, not on, not on this one. That's not what we're doing yet. We are going to do BL Touch, but um, we're on the wrong day here. Let's go to the 16th. This is what we're going to do. We're going to look at some design considerations that you have to at least consider, think about, uh, when you are... Uh, planning to print something. Now sometimes you're going to do the printing process, 3D printing, as sort of a test. Maybe you've designed a part that's going to end up made out of metal or some other material, some other manufacturing process entirely, and you just want to test it with 3D printing. So that's not what we're talking about. Um, although these things will still apply because some things, uh, maybe they, they change the way the part uh, ends up like dimension wise or strength wise uh, depending on some of these settings but what I'm really talking about is let's say you intend for the part the final part whatever it is to be 3d printed uh, there are some things you can do and need to do or at least consider um, as part of that process the design process there's um, a field of study study I don't know field of uh, I, I don't know if you would call it study so much as uh, application called design for manufacture and design for manufacture and assembly and these are entire careers where your job is to go in and make sure that the parts that are going to be made and assembled uh, are going to be easily made and assembled so that you don't have these like a, a empty hole inside a solid block of aluminum how are you going to get that empty hole in there if the block is solid you know so how you could print that for sure, but is that the best process to go about? Um, and can you even print aluminum? Uh, and, and if you do, is it going to have the same strength as a you know, bulk material of aluminum? So uh, these, there's a whole career around this sort of stuff and on, on how to go about designing parts so that uh, you look ahead at what they're going to be used for. Are they going to be mass assembled? you know, mass manufacturing? If, if so, every little tiny thing that you can optimize has a huge effect. If you want to make one of them, then yeah, it probably doesn't make that big a difference um, how you assemble it or how you manufacture it. You're just going to make the one. Um, but when you're making thousands or tens of thousands or more, uh, every little decision that you make on the design side of things affects the end result of, you know, profits. So we're, we're talking to something similar to that, except this is designing specifically for additive manufacturing because it does um, open up some new options that you don't have in traditional manufacturing. Um, and it obviously has some weaknesses. Um, one of them being, you know, the, the printed part is going to have different properties than what a bulk material version of this same part might have. Um, I'm going to mostly be talking specifically about FDM or FFF, so the fused deposition modeling or the fused filament fabrication. Um, the thing that we've been doing with the Ender 3 where you melt up plastic and spit it out of a nozzle and lay it on top of itself. So that's particularly what we're talking about, but um, some of these ideas will translate over to some of the other types of printing. We haven't really talked about the other types of printing, but there are um, let's see, what, five maybe big categories of printing, one of them being very, very narrow that I don't even know gets used anymore. Um, I guess I guess we could talk about those just in name. So obviously there's the FDM, the one that we've been doing where you uh, extrude molten plastic onto itself to create a structure. Uh, there's SLA, so that is a selective laser apparatus. So you, this is one of the older it might be the first commercially available style of 3D printing. And this is back in the 1980s when it's commercially available. Research for this stuff goes back even further than that. Um, but uh, in the 1980s, there's a resin, a vat of red, and, and we still have these. There's still some of the best printers we produce and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but vats of resin that are selectively cured by shining a laser on the resin and it cures. It's a photoreactive resin and so when it hits the light from the laser hits it uh, it cures in place so um, there's that style 
there is a, a powder deposition type where um, you have a powder like a starch and you glue it together temporarily with almost like an inkjet. In fact, some of the early printers l use the same hardware as an inkjet printer would at the time. Um, and it spits out, instead of ink, it's spitting out a binder and it binds these uh, powder particles together. It could even color them, so it could be full color. Um, and then you post-process it a little bit to make it um, hard, or now you can actually give it different properties depending on what you uh, infuse into this powder. Do you make it rigid or kind of flexible or whatever? Um, that still is around. It's not one of the bigger types of printing. Um, it is full color, uh, so that's nice about it. Um, so that's three. Uh, let's see, a fourth one would be a relatively new type of printing. Well, um, let's, let's go, let's skip that one for now. Um, let's go to, um, the idea of selective laser, but instead of, uh, curing a resin, you're curing a powder. So it's sort of the combination of the first two. Um, you're using a laser to heat up particles of a metal. So stainless steel, for instance, stainless steel powder, and you are welding it together more or less with a laser. Uh, and so this is selective laser centering. And you can build up metal pieces that are pretty close to the same properties as a bulk material, except that you were able to manufacture them in these really crazy geometries that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do if you were subtractive, if you were putting it on a mill or a lathe or something like that. Um, so there's that style. Again, those are half million dollar and up printers. So they're they're not for the you know casual user, uh, at least not yet. Maybe there are people who are trying to reduce the cost of these. There are groups um, I've even seen and watched the other day um, on YouTube a video of uh, a, basically a hobby level user uh, who used their TIG welder. I guess it was TIG. I'm not sure, but uh, a welding machine, wire feed welding machine uh, that uh, strapped it to a printer and, you know, tried to weld on top of welds. And, and there, there are some people who are trying to do that and who have some success doing that. Um, and there's some really fancy, like, um, six axis, you know, the arm, the printer arm or robotic arm uh, that do basically that. Uh, it's interesting. Um, again, not super cheap to do very well, though. Um, so there's that. There's the MSLA, so the masked stereo, uh, or well, um, selective lay. It's not laser, selective light at this point uh, apparatus. Um, and so these are the little resin printers that you can get kind of alongside the FDM printer that we're using in that same price range. There are printers that use resin and an LCD screen as a mask, shine light through it, UV light, and cure the um, resin that way versus a laser. These have a really big advantage in that you can cure, selectively cure an entire surface of resin at one time. So it doesn't matter if you're printing one part or as many parts as you can feel on the little print bed, um, it takes the same amount of time. So they're actually pretty, pretty nice. Um, we'll look at one later. Uh, I have one over, over there that we'll look at. Um, and then there's this really weird one that, again, I don't even know if it still exists, but uh, early on, or not early on, but uh, a while back, there was a printer, and I only ever saw one, but uh, it printed on paper, sheets of paper, full color, so it would print an outline in full color, just like an inkjet printer would, but then it also traced it, kind of like a Cricut or a Silhouette would now on vinyl, and uh, it did that over and over again and indexed these sheets of paper that you would glue together. Uh, you know, they'd be adhesive paper and you would stack them together to create the object. So it, they come out actually really colorful. They're very, because you know, you're inkjet printing on paper and then stacking all this paper together. Um, and I don't know that that even still is, exists anymore, but um, it would really only be for um, you know, an, an aesthetic type model. It's not going to be a functional model at all, but it would give you a full color model of whatever it is you're printing. I don't even remember the name of those printers, but uh, they printed on paper and you stacked up the paper and, uh, you know, thousands of sheets of paper would make some 
three-dimensional model. Anyway, we're going to stick for mainly uh, designing for FDM printing. So um, let's let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about that. And then I've got a few things over here that assuming we... Oh, you know what? Now that I'm looking at it, I do need to talk about these first. At least these in case we run out of time. So uh, let's let's talk about these. So one of your assignments for um, the class is to print three calibration test type models. These are two of them. The other one, I don't have one of right here. I'd have to dig around to find one, but it's the retraction test model. Um, so as for the class, these are, you don't have to repeat them over and over and over again as far as I'm concerned to prove that you can print one. Um, if you are using them to test and calibrate, then yeah, you might need to print over, you know, multiple times, iterate on things. Um, this is a typical, uh, well, we're kind of crooked there. Let's turn it where we're right side up. This is a typical model for a temperature tower. So along the side here, you've got 220 up to 180 degrees or down to 180 degrees. Nor uh, you should start with your hottest temperature at the bottom and then gradually get cooler because um, you, might, you, you, know, you might print at a cold enough temperature that it doesn't print at all. So you don't want to start with your really cold temperature, cold still being like 180 degrees, but um, cold temperature and not ever get anything to print. So um, you start at the hottest temperature you think you're going to need and drop maybe five degrees every time. And what you're looking for is um, where does the print look the best? And so this particular model has a couple of features. It's got a bridge across here that you're looking at to look for drooping. Um, none of these look terribly bad uh, drooping. You know, there's none that are really sagging very far. A little bit in some of these colder temperatures, there's a little bit of droop. Um, you're looking at, you know, the surface finish and these little undercuts here. How do they turn out? Uh, here you can kind of see a little bit of uh, stringing in this one. I don't know how well it shows up on the camera. I'll try and focus a little bit. You can kind of see those strings there. They're not even much. I wouldn't worry about those really. Um, and so you're trying to get a, an idea of maybe you've got a new filament and you don't know the correct temperature to print it at. So you print out one of these. Now you can't just print this geometry it also has to change temperature at each one of these uh, uh, levels so that you actually are printing at a different temperature. So um, there are processes. I think on Moodle, I put a pre-sliced, this one actually, I think it's this one, pre-sliced where it's got the temperature changes built into it. And uh, you can just print that uh, as it is. And as long as you're doing PLA, because it goes from 220 to 180 other materials, that's not their printing range. So it wouldn't make sense. Um, but if you're testing a PLA filament, um, so this is something that maybe you switch brands or you're trying out a new type of filament. This could be a way to figure out what, uh, temperature to print it at. Most filament are going to give you some indication, you know, print it at 238 to 265. That's a pretty big range. Um, and maybe you want a specific thing out of it. Uh, generally, the hotter you can print, the more layer, interlayer adhesion you're going to have. So it will generally be a stronger part. But the walls might be a little bit lumpy. You know, not quite as smooth. The colder you print, generally you'll have smoother surfaces. But the part will be not quite as strong because you're not printing as hot of material on top of the previous layer. And so there won't be quite as much bonding between those layers. And so you want to find, you know, kind of that, that sweet spot. And it's not always right in the middle of that range that they, you know, it's not always right in the middle of this. Now, when the manufacturer gives you numbers, then you can be relatively confident in them. Um, you do have to recognize that your printer is going to read a number based on a thermistor and your printer's 230 degrees Celsius may not be exactly the same temperature as another printer's 230 degrees Celsius. There's calibrations involved and, you know, configurations of hardware and all of that that may make your number a little bit different. 
So your 230 might be another printer's 225 or something. Um, so the point of this is to uh, look and see in this one, you know, it looks like it can actually print pretty well at any of these temperatures. So I probably would go somewhere in the middle. Um, the, the lower ones do have a little bit of stringing and I generally don't want the weaker parts and the surface doesn't look actually bad at all in any of these hotter temperatures. So in this one, I would probably go, you know, up towards the hotter end a little bit, 205. That's typically where I end up printing PLA anyway. But for the class, you just need to print one of these and um, give a description of what you read off of it. It could be that what you read is this filament on this printer prints at anywhere from 180 to 220, just fine. Um, and that's fine. That's good to know. Um, or it could be that it won't even print. This filament won't print below 190. You know, it just uh, creates a big mess at the top or whatever. Um, so that's the point of those. You don't have to iterate until you get it right. There is no right on it. This one uh, is for a tolerance test. So I like this particular one because it has these chamfers. I don't know if you can see them, but it has these chamfers on the bottom of the part so that um, you're not so worried about the nozzle height off the bed. As long as you're close, then um, the the nozzle height off the bed isn't going to affect the way this one works. Uh, for instance, if you are too close to the bed, it could be that just this first layer is just all squished together and you can't break any of these little dials apart and it looks like your tolerances are horrible. Um, but the point of this one is that it has, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different uh, tolerances or gaps between the wheel inside and the hole that it's in. And you, and it also has these little hex on the back that you can use a hex wrench to kind of break, help break them loose. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to see which one of these is the smallest gap that I can reliably print and still break the part of loose. Maybe you want to have a print in place type of model where it all prints as one thing, but once you're done with it, it can articulate. Um, and so you need to know what your printer is reliably able to print gaps, you know, what size gap. And so these take a little bit longer to print because there's a lot going on there, a lot of little circles to draw. It's not terribly thick, but it might take, I don't know, maybe an hour or more to print one of these. You don't have to get it right. So you don't have to unlock all of these uh, wheels in order to have succeeded at this for the class. For the class, you print one, you break apart the ones that uh, you can, and this one actually, it's tight, but it does have all, even the point one uh, is is loose. It also gives you an idea of what kind of t uh, clearance you're going to have when you when you set one of these gaps in the model that you're designing. So this is more for designing. This is one of the design things that we're talking about is you need to know what is your printer able to do as far as hold a, a gap between parts that need to move later on. Um, so this one, I would say that it could go down to 0.1 millimeters and, and you'd have a close fit. Uh, and then you've got some really loose fits, you know, if you're trying to do 0.4 millimeters or something like that. So do you want something that's more or less free spinning? Do you want something that's kind of in the middle? Do you want something that's a close fit? Um, and you can use one of these to tell you. Now, if nothing breaks loose, that's okay for the class, but it does tell you that your printer is probably not well calibrated. Um, so on here, what you're looking at is mostly the flow rate. So if you're over extruding, then um, obviously your gaps are going to be closed up. It sort of could uh, show a problem in a loose belt. You know, you're not, you're, you're not holding the position correctly um, that would show up in all your prints though so all your prints would have these wobbly edges so it doesn't you would see that in here but that's not the point of this one um, it also can tell you a little bit about your temperature possibly you're printing too hot if everything's unlocked but your flow rate uh, everything is locked down you can't unlock anything um, but your flow rate calculations are correct then you might be printing too hot and it's just m melting together um, so again, this one, you just need to print one of, and, uh, you know, make a little description of which one of these are you able to unlock. And, uh, then you don't have to take any further action as far as the class goes. You may want to just to get your printer dialed in a little better. 
but um, for the class that's fine. Um, the other one is a retraction test. That one, it's a quick print. The one I recommend is a quick print. Um, and you'll, you'll almost never get it completely right because it, it intentionally creates situations where it's really hard to not get rid or to get rid of all of the strings between the little spikes that it prints. Um, and that's okay. You don't have to iterate on it a lot. It is the fastest one to iterate on, but it, it has the least effect on most things other than strings. Um, and strings, you can always, if you have a model that comes out with strings on it, uh, you can always remove them manually. Um, if they're really heavy strings, you can cut them off. If they're kind of light strings, just hit it with a, a hair dryer or a heat gun and uh, they'll almost absorb back into the material. So that's the point of these things. Um, they do have to do with the design side of things because uh, you need to know some of these abilities of your printer. But uh, as far as the class goes, you don't have to try and print them over and over and over again until you get them looking perfect. All right. So let's talk about some, some ideas, six or seven different ideas for designing for 3D printing. So one of the things, and again, we're mainly focused on uh, the FDM style of printing. Other styles may not have to have some of these considerations, but uh, we're talking mainly about FDM printing. And the first thing is uh, self-supporting angles. So in general, you know, if we go in Cura, that's not Cura, that's SolidWorks. If we go in Cura, then um, we have a part here. If it has an angle on it that's too shallow, something like that, you know, we want to print that and I slice it, then it is going to not be, it's going to put all the, it's going to need all this pink, this light, Oh, we're not looking at it. Hold on. There we go. Um, so I just I just angled this little bar here. You can kind of see it like that. Um, it needs all of this support material to, to hold it in place because if I don't have the support material and I go to print some of these layers, they're going to print um, in midair. So there's enough of an overhang. You know, it, it would have, it would be able to print this, but all these little areas right here where it's just printing in midair would be drooping and so you'd have all these little sags underneath the part and so there's all of this um uh, yeah <laughs> yeah i think there's a delay so the um it's actually a longer delay than i thought i eventually get it shared <laughs> so um the uh the support it sometimes is, is inevitable that you just need this support material. Um, but if you have, and, and I don't have you printing one of these, but there are angle tests that have multiple angles and you can find out what your printer is capable of as far as overhangs go. But if you don't know, in general, if you just go to 45 degrees, then most printers will print that with no support material. Um, now this one would be kind of bad because I've got it sitting on this one little spot right here. So it would probably just break off the bed, but uh, let's ignore that. Um, now I've got it set to where, I don't even know if this is 45 degrees or not. doesn't quite look 45, does it? Um, let's, let's reset our orientation here because I don't know where I'm at anymore. Uh, let's lay it flat on there. Now we can rotate it at 45. So there's 45. And then let's move it up. Something like that. Remember, when you're in Cura anyway, and in a lot of others, you can actually embed things into the bed, uh, and it will just ignore those parts. So that's, that's a way to print just a section of a model if you need to. So let's see. And this one's still set to put all of that support material at 45 degrees. You can change that. Um, but until you know, let's see, where's our support? Oh, mine's set at 35 degrees overhang. Let's change it to 45. 35 is, um, is measured from, well, let's change it to 46. 
There we go. Um, so I guess 45 is the, it's equal to 45 or not. This angle, and you have to worry about um, different slicers for giving you different pieces of information. Um, the, this one is measuring from the Y axis. So that's why I had to do 46. Um, so it was at 35, so it had to be very straight, you know, not very tilted at all before it would decide it would print that without any support material. In general though, 45 doesn't produce enough overhang to create any problems underneath there. Um, like, like I said, there are models that you can go in and um, test this for your individual printer. That are, they, they just have a, an arc that has a bunch of different angles in it, and you can figure out where your printer begins to fail. Um, so that's one thing is if you design your part or orient it anyway so that it doesn't have angles greater than whatever your printer's ability to create parts with no support, uh, then you will not need all that support material. Um, uh, let's go over to SolidWorks because that'll kind of give us an idea of something. Um, let's do a new part. Oh, actually, I'm already in a new part. I just need to go to sketch. Uh, so let's say we want to print a cube. A cube by itself is no big deal, right? You, you can print a cube. Um, but well, let's say we want a hole through this cube. So let's cut a, I just put one in here. Didn't, I'm not worried at all about the type or placement of this hole. I just want a hole in here. So one thing I could do is I could print this. Hold on, let me turn on perspective. It really messes with me when it's not on. Um, I could print it standing up, right? In fact, this is the best orientation to get um, the hole the right size because now your your printer as it's printing this part from the bottom down here up through the layers to the top it's drawing circles to make the the size of the hole so if that's possible that's the better orientation but let's say that for whatever reason you have to have the part the rest of the part has geometry that forces it to be this direction so the bottom uh, is down here and it prints layers up here this hole is either going to have some support material in it depending on the size of the hole right so if it's a big hole then it's going to need some support if it's a small hole it may get away without it or if you don't put support material in here it's going to have little droops at the top up here so a thing you can do instead of drilling a round hole in it is you can put a um, non-round hole so let's put a well, I'm just going to draw it with lines. If if all you need is the hole and not necessarily a round hole or anything that like that, then build a hole like this, so that um, it doesn't it has the um, 45 degree or whatever your printer is capable of doing without support material, and and put this kind of hole in there you're not limited anymore to only round holes because you have to drill them uh, in a piece of aluminum since you're building it up layer by layer then take advantage of the fact that it's layer by layer and you can make square holes or you could make this one's going to be harder for me to draw but uh, let's see if i can draw it um let's do another extruded cut um how am I, let's i'm gonna draw it this way Put the roof of it as uh, you know 45 degree angles and then put the bottom of it as a hole so sort of a teardrop shape oh I don't think I connected them <laughs> so we won't worry about that I don't think I, I think I've got it yeah it's right there I can see it didn't connect those I kind of want to fix it just so we can we just do this there we go there we go and now you have the round part of the hole if you need it and you can make a more teardrop I just don't have time to go in there and design a very nice teardrop but the whole point is um, put a angled roof on the top of your hole so that when you're printing you don't need support material in there a lot of times that's fine um, 
you know, all you need is a, a passageway through the block. It doesn't have to be any particular shape. You just need to get something through there, even if it's a bolt. It doesn't necessarily matter if it's round or not. Um, and since you aren't limited to traditional subtractive processes, then you can make holes that aren't round, and that's okay. Um, and so that that's a way to not have to deal with support material that you either have to remove later or it's difficult to remove um, or something like that. You can get away with not having to do that part of the cleanup process by designing holes that are not um, round. You can also use this if you need to eliminate material. Maybe you need it to be lightweight um, and you need, uh, you know, a way to do that in a piece of metal would be to drill a bunch of holes in it. Uh, and you can use this same process to uh, eliminate weight. Instead of drilling round holes, drill diamond shaped holes. Um, when you are printing, this goes kind of back to orientation. Think about the critical surfaces, critical faces, critical features of the part that you are intending to print and orient the part in mind with those uh, features. So for instance, for, for this hole, if I wanted a, if I really did want a circular hole and, a, and I didn't have to print it this way, I could print it this way, then this is a much better orientation because now it's actually tracing the circles out and I'll get an accurate size circle. Um, it could be that uh, there's an interface part that this thing that you're going to print has to interface with some other part. Uh, and so orient that part to where it is parallel to the, the bed of your printer, at least for these style printers. Different printers have different motion systems, but um, for these where you're moving the, uh, the, the print head, the nozzle, uh, in X and Y, and then, well, well, in this one, we're just moving it in X, we're moving the bed in Y, and, and we're moving it in X and Z, actually. But if you print parallel, if you print the features that you're interested in maintaining parallel to the bed, then they'll have a better chance of coming out the correct or, uh, dimensions. If it is a very specific dimension that you need to maintain, um, it is possible to um, do a couple of different things. It's, it's possible to print the hole and then size it correctly later. Now, I'll tell you that PLA, the material PLA, um, does not machine well. It doesn't sand well. Um, and so if you need to do any sort of touch-up work to PLA mechanical type things where you're reaming out the hole or trying to sand the surface, it doesn't do very well with that. Um, ABS does much better. PETG does pretty good. Um, but a PLA is, is really tough to, to sand and machine in any way. It just kind of gums up everything if it does anything. So the material choice itself will affect your ability to go in and modify the parts after they're printed. But um, there is one thing that it takes pretty well and all these materials take pretty well and that is inserts. So if you have a feature that has to be a certain size and you're afraid your printer is not going to be able to maintain that size, uh, then instead of trying to build this hole exactly the dimension you want it, build it to accept a insert that you can machine. Um, one popular type of insert is a uh, threaded insert. So, uh, you know, these, these little plastic materials, you can thread into them um, as long as you don't plan on that being a, you know, a continual use. You're not constantly undoing and tightening and fastening and all this kind of stuff. Um, because the threads will wear or if you don't need a lot of uh, clamping strength on it then you can you can thread into this plastic with some reasonable amount of um, force but maybe you need to have these something that you take apart all the time um, so you're constantly using the threads or you need a little bit more clamping force there are th uh, heat set threaded inserts let me see if I can find a picture of some I actually have some they're just not handy heat set threaded insert here we go here's a good picture of one um, so this little guy 
you can kind of see it's got these, and they have different knurled sides on them, different patterns. Um, but inside it is threads. This is, this is a brass insert, and most of them are brass, but I assume you can get other materials. Super cheap. Um, you know, this one is uh, price 32 cents each, so they're not terribly expensive. Um, I, I think you can actually get cheaper ones than that even. Um, but this is a way to get metal threads into your uh, plastic part. It does take a little bit of practice. Uh, what you do is you take something like a soldering iron, heat up the insert, and then press it into the plastic as it's hot. Um, so it takes some timing on, you can, you can easily get it too hot and it just kind of melts through the whole piece or whatever. Um, but it, it does give you a way to get, um, solid pieces. In fact, I think I have one that's, yeah, right here, right here. Now this one kind of sunk a little weirdly, but I'll show it to you. So, uh, you, you build a hole that's, uh, a particular diameter, the, the part that you're the the insert tells you what diameter to build the hole um or you can guess um and then you you heat it up and then press it into the uh block right here now this one did not seat very well um, on this side it's fine this side it's kind of messed up looking um, but that will give you pretty solid way to you know repeatedly use threads in a plastic part um, here's another way. Maybe you don't want to pay the 32 cents for one of these. Here you've just left a little slot. This one we'll have to zoom in on. Just left a little slot in here with a hole going through this way. And um, I don't have a screwdriver handy to undo this with. Maybe this will do it. And so what you've got now is you have metal threads, but the threads are... A nut that you have put into wow this is a long screw <laughs> you've just slid this nut into this little slot here if I can get it out oh it's a blind hole in this one um, so it only drops in <laughs> so you may not get that out sometimes this hole goes all the way through and uh, you can press it out this one uh, I guess I made it where it only uh, goes in one direction and then it kind of doesn't come out at all. Um, you can take that same idea and as you are printing, you can print the slot and then right before you, <clears throat> right before your printer is about to close up the hole, put the insert inside the hole and then let it print over top of it and it'll never come out. Um, it can, I don't like that particularly um, because it does have the, the possibility anyway, not necessarily tendency, but possibility of uh, stripping out inside there and you can't do anything about it. You can't replace it. This one you can replace. This one you can kind of replace, although you're almost always gonna make a mess of it. Um, like it's already melted. And if you try to remelt and move it out, it's just gonna probably make a big mess. You could probably get a larger one in there, um, but you'd never get the same size to seat well again. Um, so those are ways that you can put metal pieces into your print. It doesn't have to be threaded inserts either. It could just be a metal reinforcing bar. So maybe you need a particular uh, strength area and a bunch of plastic around it. Then as it's printing, drop in that metal reinforcement and then let it print over the top of it. Um, well, I, don't, I won't do that today, but we'll look at some of that idea a little later. Um, speaking of that though, that idea of making parts stronger in some places and weaker in others. Not intentionally weaker, but you're just not making them strong in that part. Um, let's, let's go back to here. Let's go to Cura. And uh, let's put our part. Actually, let's just erase that part. All right. Um, let's say that we do want our little bar here, but... Um, we want it to be a little bit stronger in a certain place. Um, now I've got an add in in the extensions up here. Oh, it's off the screen. Let me bring it down a little bit. There we go. In extensions, I have an add in that call that is called part for calibration. Um, you can, you can, uh, go to the marketplace over here and, uh, there are plugins 
that you can install. This one is, um, which one is, this is calibration shapes is what it's called. Um, I also have this custom support thing that uh, is pretty neat. I won't talk about it today, but this calibration shapes, what it does is it lets you add in cubes and cylinders, tubes, um, temperature towers, retraction tests. So it has a lot of kind of pre-built geometry that you don't have to go and find it somewhere on your computer. Um, in this case, I'm just going to add a cylinder. And so it'll put just a random cylinder that you can then go in and size. So you can move it around wherever you want. Uh, you can size it whatever size you want. You can it differently and what I'm going to do with this is um, let's say that I have a part that needs a strong er area somewhere um, and that somewhere is right here so I'm going to take this piece and orient it to intersect the part of the actual part I want to print I don't want to print the cylinder I want to use the cylinder to define a section of the part I do want to print to have different properties. So maybe a lot of this bar, this bar, um, doesn't need to have a whole lot of strength. It just needs to have its, its walls and a little bit of infill. But this area where this cylinder intersects it, that could be around a hole, or it could be a spot where there's gonna be a contact, an external contact force right there or something, who knows. Um, but that part needs to have a stronger piece and I don't want to print this whole bar with with a lot of infill because the rest of it doesn't need it so what I can do is I can go to um, this per model settings and I can select that um, I can do one thing I can make this into a support I can print normally or modify the settings for where this overlaps the other part so um, I can select that I want to change the infield density or even the pattern and I can make that piece 100% solid and then when I go to slice it you know my normal infill is set to what 10% right now let's see yeah so my my normal infill is 10% grid this section right here is going to be a hundred percent infill so when I slice it and I preview it Let's look at where that cylinder intersected. Now this is a top layer, so it's 100%. Top layers, and then there, you can kind of see where it has put extra material where the cylinder intersected the rectangle. So all of that is 100% infill. Now it does it with walls and then infill. Um, so it's doing the number of walls, at which you can also change. Uh, selectively you can have that section just be a bunch of walls or no walls and just infill or whatever you want um, and so you can selectively reinforce or lighten whichever way you want to go uh, pieces of your model by intersecting it with um, geometry like I've got here so cube cylinders tubes or you could go in and make two models like when you're designing the part you could build a skeleton, kind of like uh, you know, a animal has a skeleton, and then it has that's relatively strong. You know, it's got bones and things like that. So you could design this skeleton internally, and then you could um, design the actual outer geometry as a separate part. Bring both of those into Cura, uh, align them correctly, and if you build them off the same origin, Cura will align them by default to overlap. Um, based on that origin you can I, th I don't remember the uh, selection if you select them and um, I, th I think if you group them I, I can't remember if it's group or merge we'll have to look at that later um, but I think it's group but it might be merge it might be merge um, if they have the same origin system they're built off the same origin then it will merge them together at that origin system so that they're correctly aligned um, and you don't have to try to manually align them. So you can do that uh, and then go in and pick the model that's the skeleton and create it as a per model setting and give it a higher density 
uh, where they intersect each other. And so that skeleton now is like this 100% dense or whatever percent you want uh, internal structure where the rest of it is printed, you know, at a kind of low density, or I don't know if I would go too low. You know, if, if we if we look at this one, it does have some problems. Look, the uh, the solid piece isn't really connected to the, any of the infill. I've got such a low infill here that it would be better if this infill for the rectangle at least touched the other part. Right now, it's just sitting on the, the bottom surface and the top surface. It's not connected to any of the other walls. So it would be a little better if this was connected to the walls, you know, and you, and you could probably, I haven't tried this, so this could go wrong, but let's try another one. Uh, let's add a cube and scale this thing down. Well, let's move it over here, scale it down. Or why is it scaling weirdly? There we go. And then let's, there we go. And let's give it the same idea. For some reason, it doesn't want infill density to stay on. I don't know why. And let's see if we can connect our part. Yeah, now it's connected to the walls, sort of. It's still got this, I mean, these would bond together. Um, it would be nice if it actually traced around them. To get it to trace around them instead of do a circle and a rectangle, I would have to um, build this circle and rectangle together. And you could probably do that with the merge in here, just put them overlapping and merge them together, then they're one piece and it would actually trace around them instead of kind of doing them separately. Um, but those are things that you can do. I guess that's not necessarily on the designing side of thing, unless you do this up front. You design the skeleton or you design the reinforcements uh, as a separate model and then import the two models and define uh, stronger areas in your part versus the regular areas. Um, other things that you can do while you're designing for printing is you're no longer limited to um, having to build individual pieces and then bolt them together. Uh, you can go in and build parts that are already assembled. Um, assuming you have worked out, you know, the tolerances for what your printer is able to hold, then you can build uh, parts that move, but were printed as all one piece. So you can consolidate some assembly steps um, in the printing process. And this can get very complicated. Um, I wish I could find, give me a second and let me see if I can find, um, I never can remember the name of this, uh, thing that I'm looking for, but, uh, there are some really nice, uh, 3D models that print as a single piece, but are actually um, assembled after you print them. Um, so they snap together, but they're all one piece and they use articulated joints. Um, I just can't remember. The, the one I'm thinking of in particular Maybe it'll come to me shortly. Or if somebody remembers what I'm talking about or can recognize what I'm talking about, you can put it in the chat. But it's a, um, there's one guy in particular that does a really good job of uh, building printable print in place. Maybe that, maybe I need to search for that. Print in place is what it's called, um, is the, the type of thing. You've seen them with the little octopus with the tentacle legs that move around or the, uh, thing like that where it prints all in one piece but uh, it's articulated oh here we go I think I found it these uh, he has some free ones but um, something like this so it prints all in one flat piece um, but you can fold it along hinges uh, you know, kind of ball joint type setups, uh, and you can print a solid model. Um, 
I know we've got some free ones that you could try out. So, we've got spaceships that print in pieces. Batmobile, that one's uh, the school bus. General Lee's even in there. Um, I know there, hey, there's a free one. Oh, no, that's just pieces for Kit, the Knight Rider car. Um, but there are some that you can try here. Let's see. Oh, again, just pieces. I can't remember the free one that I tried. Um, but they are actually really interesting. If nothing, maybe you don't want the model. Oh, there's an at, -AT Or, I think that's an at, -AT. Looks like the pieces to one. And it's free. Oh, yeah, it is. There it is. Um, so, one thing that this can help you do, printing things like this, um, it gives you an idea of how to build in different joints that do have different motions to them. Um, you know, the kind of tolerances that are involved. Um, some of the things where it, you build in temporary supports even. Uh, that's a snail. <laughs> okay. Oh, the, the bus. Yep. Um, so it, it can give you ideas on how to take advantage of the type of printing you're doing, but still create movable posable type things uh you know the simplest one is what we've got over here where it's just a wheel inside a hole and you have rotation um, so don't think that your models that you're designing for 3d printing have to be static um, they can be uh, articulated in different ways they you can print them in one orientation where um, the other benefit of printing like this is I don't know if you've noticed or not, but different directions for printing, you'll get better details. Kind of like what I was talking about with the circle, um, where you've got the circle uh, printed in one orientation, looks more like a circle, um, and print it perpendicular to that, and it's a bunch of lines stacked up to make it look like a circle. So um, you can gain the advantage of printing things in their best orientation and then assembling the model. Um, if you're not, you know, interested in the, you know, it all has to be printed at one time and then I'm going to snap it together, still take the same idea and just glue the parts together later. Don't, don't fall into the trap that if you're printing something, you have to print all of the pieces that you're going to deal with. Um, for instance, if you wanted to print a, uh, a particular cylind cylindrical type object, but really the, only the printed part that matters is on the end, then make the cylinder out of something that's already cylindrical, a PVC pipe or, you know, a cardboard tube or whatever, the right diameter, and then just print the cap that goes on it that lets it interface with something else. Um, don't think that you have to print the entire part. Use as much pre-built geometry uh, from other things or mix and match materials. Uh, so that you don't spend all your time printing boxes and printing cylinders and things like that. Um, another little thing that I sort of mentioned on this, I didn't talk too much about it, but I mentioned it, is that when you are printing things that are going to be, you know, on the surface, so I'm printing it down here, sometimes um, that first layer, particularly if you're having trouble with, um, uh, adhesion, you print it hotter, slower, and more squished, so it's really stuck down. Um, what that can do, though, is it can make this first layer um, exaggerated. It can make it uh, squished too much to where it's no longer the right dimensions. So that's called elephant's foot, um, because a lot of times uh, it will kind of, you can, you can kind of see it on this one. You can see how that, that corner sticks out. That's because this was printed down here and it was really squished down. And so that, that bottom layer or two are not the same size as all the other layers. And so you don't necessarily want that. So you could go in, just deal with it, and then shave it off later. But um, another thing you can do is you can add a chamfer to the bottom. So how these have a little bit of a chamfer to the bottom. So what that'll do is that you go, you chamfer in, and then if it gets squished out a little bit, you're still undersized. Or, or if you do it perfectly, then you're exactly the size you were before. Uh, so you do have to 
um, or that is a way to deal with squishing your part down but not having to deal with the fact that that squished layer is going to be um, wider than all the other part. You still have to deal with the fact that um, you squished it down and it may not be the right height anymore because the first few layers aren't the right thickness. So you have to think about that. Um, Cura does have another way that maybe you're, you're dealing with uh, the holes not being the right size um, the you know you're you're a little bit off, but you don't want to go in and change all of your calibrations. Um, there is a thing called horizontal expansion right here, and, and there's one for there was three different versions in Cura. Horizontal expansion, um, initial layer, so the elephant's foot, that first layer, horizontal expansion, and whole horizontal expansion. So if you have any of these features that are not quite the right size, um, you can expand, and this is not a percent, this one's in millimeters. So you can either expand or contract a layer to account for the fact that it's squishing out too wide, or the holes are not quite large enough, or maybe they're too large, you need to shrink them. Um, it will go in and change the size of holes for the whole horizontal expansion. Um, and, and if you hover over these, oh, Hold on, you're not looking at my screen again. Um, all I did is I typed in Horizon and these three expansion options show up. This is in Cura. I don't know the similar terms in um, some of the other slicers or if they even have that, this option. Um, but this one you don't have to design ahead of time. You can go in and in your slicing you can adjust for these different uh, expansions. Maybe you want a part to be slightly larger, slightly undersized. You don't want to scale the whole part, but you want to just change the first layer or just change the holes to have a little more clearance or a little less clearance um, or maybe change the entire part. Um, so that is a way to tweak a part without having to redesign the part. Maybe you've already, maybe you went to McMaster. Uh, hopefully you know this. You can go to McMaster and uh, find you know some sort of part that you want maybe you need one of these shims most things in McMaster have CAD models if you go to the product detail you can download a CAD model of almost all the parts in McMaster not all of them some of them don't have CAD models but almost all the parts you can download a CAD model now this one is you know it's a ring so it's not a big deal but um, maybe when you download that, your printer isn't printing it the size you need it to because of just a little bit of miscalibrations. Um, you can take into account those uh, calibrations by this horizontal expansion feature. Um, and the thing I like about it is that you can do it selectively. You can either just expand the first layer um, or just the holes. And I don't just not expand. You can contract them also. Um, or maybe the whole part. The whole part probably um, I don't use as much, but uh, it, it could be useful also. Um, so that's another thing that's not really on the design side, but it's knowing the things that are able to be done once you've got a part ready to go. Um, let's see if there's any other things I kind of wanted to mention. I don't see, well, all right, so there is another feature that we're going to spend the whole lecture on, and that is there's an area, since you have the ability to create geometry in pretty much any shape you want, there's a whole field of um, taking a, a traditionally designed part like this and optimizing it to... 3D printing. So you can optimize it for weight reduction or strength or some combination of the two. Um, and uh, SolidWorks will do that. And so we're going to spend a time later, and I'm not sure how much later, but a little bit later, uh, looking at how you can go in and take a traditionally designed part and optimize it to be 3D printed. Now that you have all these new, uh, you don't, you're not limited by the subtractive processes of traditional machining, uh, you can create some interesting geometry you know, spider webby type geometry that is really cumbersome if, if it's possible even uh, to do in traditional subtractive machining. So uh, we'll look at that. That's another 
area that you can look at when you're designing parts is that you're not limited to just you know squares and circles and traditional shapes um i think that gives you some ideas i get it's not a whole course in designing for 3d printing and and only a little bits of it are talking about you know hole sizes and things like that uh speaking of holes though um we talked about here how to go in and strengthen a hole um, if you do need strength from a 3d printed part and you don't necessarily need the entire part to be solid um, and you don't want to do this process a really simple thing is just up the number of walls to like four walls so just go to the wall I've already mentioned this early early on in the quarter but um, just go to four maybe even five walls um, if you are doing anything with threaded inserts or you want to cut your own threads in here then you need four or five walls around all the holes if you do walls it's not just the outer walls it's any walls around internal holes the outside the perimeter um, they all get multiplied by whatever your number of wall line count is here and so that's a really simple way to not have to design anything you design the part with all the holes in it and then you just put um, four or five walls around all those holes and now they're much stronger um, versus having to just print the whole thing at a really high infill um, because that could take a significant amount of time um, also speaking of saving time you don't have to print the whole part you know um, if you want to print and just test uh, a a certain section of the part just move the part that you don't want beneath the surface of the bed and just print that little top piece that you need to test and figure out if um, it's going to fit right and then print the whole thing you know you don't have to print the whole part to figure out if it's going to fit just print the little sections that you need chop off the pieces you don't want to print or don't want to test um, and just print those little sections a couple of layers 10 layers of the section and uh, then you can test to see if it's going to fit the thing that you want it to fit it's going to interface correctly um, so that may not be on the design side either but it's a uh, time-saving tip I guess um, all right I think that's enough of that I did want we've got 15 well almost 15 minutes I did want to show a few things here. I kind of wanted to do this guy. Um, this is the belt tensioner that's going to go over here. I wanted to put that on. Um, I did print this material. Where'd it go? The carbon fiber PETG. Um, so PETG is um, a glycol modified PET it's the same stuff that most um, soft drink bottles the plastic bottles are made of um, it's a really good material it does print a little hotter I had to print this at um, I think at 248 is what I ended up printing it at um, bed temperature at 80 um, I printed at 70 on glue stick and it was okay um, the first few layers didn't work very well so you can kind of see that they're a little little bit you can kind of see a missing piece right there um i had to up the flow rate a little bit um and i i changed the flow rate to 105 percent and i bumped the temperature up because it just wasn't flowing quite as much as it should um but um it's a stronger in general material it still has some flex to it you know if they make pressurized soft drink bottles out of the same material it does have a decent amount of strength with it a lot of pet uh, PETG is more translucent like you know this kind of thing where it's a little bit translucent in there shiny um, this particular one has carbon fiber chopped into or milled carbon fiber strands in it um, I don't know if you call them strands but um, it's not dust it's not powder it's actually little bits of carbon fiber in there um, so again I do have remember we changed the nozzle to a hardened steel nozzle um, because uh, the brass nozzle running carbon fiber through it would uh, would eat it up really quickly um, so I, I like this material um, I will show you what happens when you don't uh, you know 
this is what happens when you don't spool the filament. So you, um, since this is a short spool, I'm not worried about it. But if you don't uh, lock down your filament, you know, trap it in here or something. In fact, this is about to come loose, isn't it? Um, if you don't do something like that, then it's going to create a big mess. Um, this is not too bad to deal with, but when you've got a kilogram of that and it looks like that, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. Or it might be worth it just to throw it away. Um, but you can re-spool them. It's just a big pain. So PETG is a good material when you need some rigidity. It's not, it is flexible, but remember we printed this at 10% infill, so it's not very solid. Um, it gets much more rigid. In fact, I printed in PETG, not carbon fiber, uh, a violin. All of this is, this is what PETG a lot of times looks like. It's a little bit shiny. Um, you can actually sand it pretty much, you can almost polish it actually. Um, I have an ocarina that I printed. Um, I don't have it here handy, but I sanded it and polished it and you wouldn't know that it was printed. Uh, you, you can't really see, other than maybe some slight color variations in the different parts of it, which you can kind of see, we can kind of see over here. You can kind of see the infill showing through um, in this pattern on here, you can see it. Um, so it, it is a good material for anything that's gonna need to have a constant force applied to it, like string force. Um, it doesn't creep as bad as PLA will. Um, this has been strong for a year now, I guess, because I did it last summer during this class. So, um, and it hasn't, you can't see any, any, uh, creep. I'd have to measure to be sure there could be a little bit of creep right in here. I can't tell. Um, but it doesn't, it's not obvious that there's any in there. Um, and so it's a good material when you need strength or you need a little bit more temperature resistance, um, because it does uh, have a higher heat deflection temperature than a PLA will. Um, and it, it ABS is also like that. It, it has a higher temperature that it can deal with. But PETG, I printed right here on this, completely open. You didn't need an enclosure. It has pretty much no odor when it prints. ABS does have a strong odor when it prints. Um, you don't have as big of an issue to worry about with delamination that you do with ABS. Um, oh, thanks for the... Looks good. I, I like that violin. It, it actually is pretty neat pretty neat it sounds okay too um, it's not horrible anyway uh, I just wanted to see if it was doable that's a that's a pattern on I think I got it off a of thing averse I didn't make it myself um, what was I saying oh um, that the PETG material is you can print it open you can print it on the ender 3 um, it does get close to the upper limit uh, and you probably can't get your bed to 80 degrees. You might can. I didn't even try. I printed at 70. Um, you don't use as much cooling. I had 33% part cooling. Um, actually, zero on the first two layers, but uh, then the 30%. Um, PETG bonds much better without the cooling on it, but if you don't have any cooling, it is going to be very stringy. It's kind of gummy uh, when you print it, um, and so it will be very stringy uh, if you don't have any amount of cooling, um, which in, you know, in this part wouldn't matter because it doesn't have a, a reason to string at all. Um, but, uh, if you have something that's going to have, you know, strings, gaps in it, where there might be strings across there, then PETG is going to have more strings. It's just the way it is. Um, but if you put a little bit of cooling on it and I did, I did 30%, 33% cooling, um, you can change that in Cura. Let's see. Fan speed. Um, you can change it here to 33% or, or any number. Turn it to whatever you want. Um, and in general, it's already turned off on the first initial fan speed. So the first couple of layers are normally zero, trying to get that first couple of layers to stick to the print bed. Um, but for PETG, you probably do want to drop this down a little bit because it'll, it will delaminate a little bit. It won't stick as well. If you um, if you run the fan full speed, um, also just in, in case you do go print some of this PETG type material, um, if you print it on a glass bed or a PEI sheet, it will bond to the point that 
it probably won't come off. So if you're printing on any material like that, um, and even on this material, put down glue stick as a release agent, not necessarily to hold it down, but to actually get it off of there when you're done. Um, so that does remind me, while I was looking around, I found a pretty handy sheet here from Simplify 3D. They make a different slicer. Um, it's not a free slicer though. Uh, it is a paid slicer, but they do make a slicer that has some nice features to it. At one time, it was the only one that had some of these features, but now Cura and, and Prusa Slicer basically have the same features. Um, but they had this nice page. I'll, I'll link to it or send it. Here it is in the chat. I'll put it in the description if I remember. Um, but it has all of your main and a couple of that you don't print very often um, filament types and then it gives you a little side-by-side -side comparison of their maximum service temperatures their ultimate strength you know stiffness durability how easy they are to print uh, printing temperatures and bed temperatures i had never seen this particular chart before i don't know if it's new or um, I just never saw it before, but this is actually a really good summary and it looks accurate. I haven't gone through every number, but it looks accurate to um, typical properties and printing temperatures and everything um, for these different materials. So uh, I would I would reference this pretty often if you're looking for a particular type of material or you just want to know a, what's the average strength of PLA, then you can see Oh, 65 megapascals is its ultimate strength, um, you know, and it's pretty stiff, you know, so it's going to be more on the brittle side. So it's not as tough as some of the other materials might be, but uh, it is strong. Um, in fact, you can see it's, I think their durability is probably pretty close to what I would call toughness. Um, it gives, if you need any requirements, you know, you need an enclosure or not, uh, you know, it tells you that here. Give you a little chart of uh, if, if it's you uh, basically none of these are UV resistant. There actually is one. Which one is this? Oh, ASA. Um, I've never printed with ASA. It does present itself as a good in between PLA and ABS, but I usually just use PDTG for that. Although it does have a high service temperature, so um, PETG has higher than PLA. But ASA is pretty high, 95 degrees Celsius before it begins to deflect on you um, when it's in service. So that's actually a good reason. We might try some ASA. Um, I think, well, it doesn't say it needs an enclosure. I've heard people say that it kind of needs an enclosure just more for exhaust than anything. Kind of, kind of smells. Um, but I've never printed it, so I don't know. Maybe I'll try and find some ASA so we can test it out. Um, but this chart is actually really handy for... Um, selecting a material to go for a particular application, which also goes into designing for um, printing. All right, um, next time we are going to look at um, some typical failure that happens and what you do with those. This is Friday. Um, I'll go in. Uh, one of the things I have you, you know, do as part of the class is print a benchy, the little boats. I've lost mine again. Um, and I'll go at some of the things I'm looking at and how you read it and what what you can do to change some of those things. Some of them are more difficult to change, but uh, some of them are really easy to uh, modify and get better prints. Um, and then I think we're next week going to do some BL Touch, you know, add in a little bit of hardware to our printer. Um, I guess I won't today install this guy, but it, it just, you undo these two, came with its own two. I, you could probably reuse those. And you bolt it right here and then you have adjustment on this axis um, they make them for this also but it was out of stock when I went to buy it um, the glue stick that I use is this but um, it I don't think that it matters that it's this one or not um, it's just a PVA based glue stick um, this is the particular one. And I, I don't know why I use this brand other than um, I was able to get off of Amazon a big box of them, pretty cheap. So um, I don't think it matters as long as it's a PVA style glue stick. Um, and I don't know that there are other styles anyway. Um, this one actually doesn't even say PVA on it, it just says non-toxic. 
Um, but this is the one I use. And I'm sure, and the other reason I'll use this one is uh, <clears throat> they make a, a one inch one. So they make a much bigger one. Um, I just don't have it right here handy. Uh, but if you have a lot of area to cover, they make a bigger one. And so that's another reason I use that brand. All right. I will see you guys on Friday. Um, if you have some uh, ideas, I do have one day coming up here, June 25th, that I'm, I don't have a particular thing planned. Um, if, if we don't do anything, I'll just move, you know, if nobody suggests something, I'll just move one of these other topics up, which is no big deal. But if there's something that you really want to see and I haven't covered it yet, or maybe something that we need to recover, then uh, give me some suggestions and I can plug it in on the 25th. Um, and otherwise, I'll just pull up one of these things that I have further down the list and move it up some. All right. I will see you guys on Friday.